Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to acknowledge our gathering today on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Welcome you to today's agenda. First of all, I'd like to welcome alternate directors Taylor, Justice, Tatum, and Goddard. Thanks for joining us. I hope I got all the names right. If not, you can deal with me after the meeting. Ms. Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the, the agenda and a motion to approve. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried, thank you. Next, Ms. Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The next item on the agenda is the public input period. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to have input on this agenda? Seeing no one rushing forward, we shall move on. Ms. Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are no delegations. There is no correspondence. There are no information items. So we move to reports. Item R1 is the report from the General Manager, Community Services, regarding Regional Recreation Strategic Plan. And with that is a recommendation. And the recommendation is that it be recommended to the board that the Regional Recreation Strategic Plan be approved. Thank you very much. I see uh, Mr. Elzinga at the microphone. Would you like to uh, open things up, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So today for the committee is the presentation of the Regional Recreation Strategic Plan. Before our consultant presents the plan, I just want to highlight that although facility funding is a priority strategy, this plan does not speak to the background or previous recommendations around recreation facility funding. So important point, if this plan is approved by the Community Services Committee today, and by the board on July the 10th, it is intended to bring to committee in August a background on facility funding since this board has not formally been presented with that information. At the end of this presentation, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna suggest that our consultant will be taking the lead on answering any questions regarding this Regional Recreation Strategic Plan. And I anticipate that I'll be answering any questions on next steps or any recreation questions really outside this plan. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Brian Johnston. Brian's lived in all four of Canada's western provinces. He's made his home in BC for the past 20 years. Over the past 45 years, he's worked as a consultant across western Canada, including every regional district in BC. In that capacity, he's tackled a wide range of parks, recreation and cultural planning issues, including funding formulas, governance structures, facility plans, and overall long-range plans. He has done more than a dozen projects in our regional district alone, including the last time a regional recreation strategic plan was completed 34 years ago in 1985. Welcome back, Mr. Brian Johnston. <laughs> uh, I feel very old uh, after that kind of recommend, uh, introduction. Thanks very much, John. No pressure, but I'm gonna have to keep doing this till I get it right, it sounds like. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board, and uh, I recognize, I think, about five members of the board who've sat for the last uh, two years and longer on a uh, regional recreation select committee governing this process that culminates with this uh, final regional recreation strategic plan now. Um, uh, and, and my thanks to those board members and others that sat on that uh, uh, committee. Um, the, uh, what I'll talk about today is just a little bit about how we got here uh, before I talk about the, uh, just a, a quick summary of what's in the strategic plan because it's been a long process, it's been divided into a number of pieces, and there's been lots of engagement as we've gone along. So the first bit is just kind of putting this into context. The uh, late in 2015, I think, the, the board uh, embarked on a process that was divided into four phases, 
uh, under the auspices of a regional recreation select committee of the board. And uh, we worked through all of those phases. Phase one was focused on uh, engaging with people, trying to find out what, uh, what the local regional needs, aspirations, challenges, issues, and trends are. And, and uh, a, a report came before the, the last board uh, on, on the results of phase one. We then proceeded with phase two to look at uh, who was using uh, major regionally significant uh, recreation spaces and where they lived and, and uh, how those services were funded. And out of phase two, we identified a significant um, disconnect between who was using and benefiting from the facilities and who was paying the operating costs and some of the capital costs for those facilities. And, and so we identified what we termed as inequities, uh, some, some, some issues that needed to be dealt with. We tried to deal with those issues in phase three. Oh, by the way, phase two also, that report came before this board and both phase one and phase two have been, I think, received and accepted by, by this, this uh, uh, board in the past. We proceeded with phase three to try and deal with the results of phase two and make some recommendations about how to reconcile the disconnect between who's paying for and benefiting from spaces and who's uh, actually um, uh, uh, paying uh, for them. Uh, who, and, and so uh, that was received and lots of discussion but no resolution of that. So that's still an outstanding issue as, as John referred to. And then finally, we used uh, all of those and some other inputs to try and uh, develop a, uh, a regional recreation strategic plan. And it's that phase four that I'm here in front of you to talk about now. Uh, I can answer questions about uh, previous phases because I've been involved in them, but, but really I think the, the focus of today is just to, a look at the plan. Uh, the objective of this phase four was really to try and provide a basis for making some decisions and guide future decisions around um, challenges, trends, um, uh, spaces, investments uh, uh, for the future, trying to put things into a, 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 a kind of a high level strategic framework that might help to guide in, in decision making. And there's also some tactical kind of suggestions in the plan about how to how to deal with some of those uh, strategic issues. <coughs> and um, we dealt with, a, a, in the plan and in all four phases, quite a broad definition of recreation. It actually comes from something called the Framework for Recreation in Canada. Um, and, and so it, it does deal with all aspects of um, uh, physical recreation, uh, social, cultural activities, sport, fitness, indoor and outdoor, structured and unstructured forms of, of recreation, all of those things which the public sector might get involved in, uh, certainly. And uh, so it's a fairly wide-ranging kind of uh, uh, plan. And. Uh, in developing this phase four, we actually went uh, at, at draft report stage back to the public and re-engaged with the public. We hadn't talked to them since phase one, and so I think it's just important for you to know that there was a fair amount of public engagement all the way through uh, in phase one and uh, a lot of talking to users in phase two. Uh, most of phase three was internal, but in phase four, we went back out to the public just to make sure we understood uh, what they'd originally told us and checked to make sure we'd heard it right and ask about uh, what people thought about what we'd done with the input they gave us in phase one and how we responded to that. So, so there's a, a fair amount of, of background behind this. We've talked to literally thousands of people and I'll just quickly review that um, all together over the course of the four phases, uh, mostly in phase one, there, there have been public surveys, there's been focus groups, there's been online engagement through your Pace, uh, Place Speak portal. Uh, we've had uh, individual boards up at facilities on, an, on uh, two occasions and a, a number of pop-up events where we would show up to a special event and engage people that were there for, for other purposes. And so we've literally talked to thousands of, of local residents over the past uh, long while. 
we also incorporated not just what people asked us to, to kind of respond to, but we looked at demographics, trends, other um, regional context and planning initiatives and, and other provincial and national kinds of frameworks, like the framework for recreation in Canada, as I, as I mentioned. And, and so all of that kind of comes together in this phase four report. I, uh, just before I kind of go through the report, some of the key findings that we, we've, we've come to that are the basis for moving forward into phase four and developing the phase four report have to do with uh, some, some high level issues. We found high levels of satisfaction. We found high levels of importance in people's minds around the issue of indoor and outdoor recreation and cultural activities in parks. We found um, some barriers to participation, primarily cost and, and age. Uh, we found a number of issues that people raised. They talked about a need to improve communications and marketing. They talked about a need to improve um, uh, uh, regional collaboration uh, around the delivery of services. They talked about confusion in a few areas, uh, about getting information and about who does what and who's responsible for what. Um, they talked about, uh, and, and we found that people moved across geopolitical boundaries fairly easily to get to the services they needed. They didn't much care whether it was in a neighboring jurisdiction, um, but they, they, and sometimes didn't know it was in a, in a neighboring jurisdiction, as, as many of you have experienced, I'm sure, in the past. Um, there was uh, some mixed perception about whether we needed more in the way of enhanced facilities, but most people um, felt that we um, uh, did not. Um, and and uh, th th there's, again, some misalignment of who's paying for services and who's benefiting for those services. So those are just some of the high-level research findings that uh, kind of anchor this report. Uh, in terms of some of the engagement uh, uh, things, again, I think I've referred to these, but uh, lots of uh, satisfaction, lots of um, uh, uh, interesting um, demand for um, unstructured activities. That's fairly common in communities we're working in over the last 10 years. There's a real shift from highly structured activities towards unstructured activities. So there's, as an example, there's a shift from team sports to use of trails that you can use when you want, with whom you want, at any level you want, and get on where you want, and get off where you want, and, and, and are much less structured kinds of activities. And so those are just examples of, of that shift. There's a, a clear preference towards multi-use kinds of things, uh, uh, experiences that have a social dimension to them. Um, there's some changes in the nature of volunteering. People are interested in volunteering more on an episodic kind of shorter term basis rather than a multi-year commitment to, to something. So there's a, there, that some of that is what is evident in, in our, um, our plan to move forward. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's most of what I wanted to, to comment on on this slide. <coughs> So now to get us to the actual plan itself, uh, which has been distributed. Um, the plan has got a bunch of parts. We have a vision. We have uh, five goals. Um, we have seven uh, strategic priorities, two of which we're saying are really high priority um, and, and more urgent in nature. Uh, we've got a number of other kind of pieces that deal with the uh, three uh, principles to be used in planning facilities and some planning tools to help to prioritize new facility projects as they might come up over the next 10 years and that aren't identified in, in our report. So there's a bunch of pieces, but before I just quickly go through those pieces, I, I'd like to say that what we found was a fairly healthy system, all, all told. Um, uh, you're doing a lot of things right. The member municipalities and the regional district are all engaged and doing lots. There's lots of facilities. There's lots of spaces outdoors. There's lots of money being spent. There's lots of participation. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot of good things happening and a fairly high level of satisfaction overall. So I would uh, characterize this plan as a kind of fine-tuning of an already well-developed and operating system. And I think that's worth noting. Um, 
It's, it's not suggesting wholesale change. It's suggesting going a little bit further down some roads you've already started going down. And it's also tried to provide a little bit of focus and structure to some decision making in the future. And a, and a little bit more regional collaboration and working together on some things that already work well. And so there's some progress to be gained, but it's, it's, it's a, of a fine tuning nature as opposed to wholesale change. So quickly going through those sections, the vision is fairly clear through access to diverse, high quality parks, recreation and cultural opportunities. Residents of the Cowichan region uh, in, in an ideal future would live active, healthy lives and, are, and would be part of strong, vibrant communities. These are the two kind of primary pieces of the business that public uh, sector recreation is in. It's in the health and well-being of citizens and the health and well-being of communities and connecting people to communities. So these are, are the two really anchoring points and, and are expressed in, in the vision that, that's being proposed. We um, uh, talk about five goals and we, we connect those goals to seven um, strategic initiatives, uh, strategic priorities. Um, the goals are fairly self-evident and they're already pretty much in place. This is just a way of kind of structuring them and verbalizing them and making them fairly transparent. Um, but, but, and again, I won't spend time on these. They're fairly self-evident. But the uh, service delivery kind of strategies, at a strategic level, we're suggesting a total of seven things. And I'll just go through each of those. The first is to ensure that governance structures uh, and guiding documents are review reviewed and that the terms of reference for those governing structures are updated. There's a whole bunch of different commissions, task forces, um, uh, appointed committees and, and uh, the various levels of jurisdiction. Some have advisory powers, some have operating kind of authority, um, and, and some are standing and some are appointed and some are, um, uh, it's, there's just a, a really complex system out there and there's some overlap in between some of these bodies that deliver service. Uh, geographically, there's some overlap and in terms of mandates, there's some overlap. And so we just uh, are, are suggesting that a review of the terms of reference for all of those, ensuring more clarity, more transparency, more consistency, more understanding of who's doing what and who's responsible for delivering what uh, is, is uh, indicated. And that's something that would be an ongoing kind of priority and would be done repetitively over the next 10 years, perhaps every three to four or five years uh, that, that would need to be done. So, so that's one of the kind of high level things that we believe you you need to think about moving forward. Number two, expanding efforts to address financial barriers to participation. We identified that fully 26% of the public out there feels like uh, the cost of accessing recreation is a barrier to their participation. And that's higher than we typically uh, see and it's uh, of concern and it's something that needs to be addressed. And there are a number of uh, systems in place to address it already, uh, municipal-based systems, regional um, systems. There are some not-for-profit kinds of uh, supports for people in financial difficulties, and there are provincial and national programs. But they're not part of a cohesive whole here that's easily accessible, and we're suggesting that that needs to happen, that uh, possibly some more coordination between all of those support systems is required so that people more easily know how to get access to the systems and how to benefit from them if they need it. Uh, strategy number three, um, we're suggesting that while you've already got fairly good uh, protocols for community engagement at municipal and regional level, that um, a subset of those broad ranging protocols might be um, looked at to focus on recreation engagement and recreation needs. And, and um, so, so that's a, a more nuanced, more specific look at how we engage the public, how we um, uh, ensure that, that we're responsive to uh, fairly rapidly changing needs and issues and resolving and responding to problems that people can identify within specifically this one service area. It's not a, a separate parallel system, it's a subset of existing systems that would already be in place. Number four, we think that some investment in, some increased investment in marketing, promotion, and communication of opportunities is required. 
you've taken some steps over the last few years to try and do more cohesive and integrated and, and connected uh, communication and marketing of all of the indoor and outdoor opportunities available in the region, but more can be done and the public is still somewhat confused. And, and efforts that to, to integrate and to, to uh, uh, more regionally and, uh, broadcast all of the opportunities available regionally and in specific communities um, have benefited and have shown progress and, and, and have shown increased uh, participation rates. And so we think more can be done. We still uh, had, had identified confusion and concern about where people get access to information and this notion of one-stop shopping. And now with all of the services in the region on one set of software for registration, it creates an opportunity to do much more in the way of integrated marketing and, and promotion and communication. It's a specific example of uh, kind of um, number five, which is increased regional collaboration and synergies across all aspects of community services. We looked at this specifically in phase three and we're very impressed with the amount of collaboration that was going on between the various recreation delivery departments that exist in the region. And we were compelled to suggest that you don't need to reinvent the structure to, to have just one structure delivering all the services to, to, to integrate. You might continue with the different structures in place and cooperating like they are now and, and just ensure that they, they continue to cooperate and collaborate and, and even do more uh, work together. So this is, um, th this is responding to needs and issues, um, collaborative programming and filling of gaps, um, doing uh, some things regionally and some things community, but creating a hierarchy of things and everybody, uh, both the municipal departments and the regional uh, systems can, can all cooperate on, on doing all of that. Um, and especially uh, in, in number six, around, uh, sorry, um, uh, around uh, uh, facility planning in, in number five. Uh, all, of, all, of, all facility planning should be done collaboratively on a regional basis to ensure that nobody's operating independently. Number six is a, a real priority, we think, and it's to go back and readdress the funding model inequities. Uh, that were identified in phase two and tried to deal with in phase three and uh, we didn't, uh, we weren't able to, to, to get consensus around this board on how to um, uh, re kind of focus on uh, a fairer and more equitable system where people that were benefiting were the same people that were paying for services. So we're thinking that, uh, that this is a more short term priority and it's something you, you might consider as a board uh, going back to and revisiting one more time to try and get that uh, uh, dealt with. It's a concern of the public and it's something the public thinks uh, needs to be done um, and it's something that I think um, a lot of individual directors think need to be done. The problem is finding common ground to resolve that issue. And number seven is a bit more specific look at uh, arts and cultural needs in the region. While well, we identified an interest in doing more in that re uh, respect, um, we also identified a number of not-for-profit agencies and public agencies all operating separately without a coordinated regional plan. And, and so a little bit more collaboration in this specific area also we think is required. And that's something that should happen in the short-term future as well over the next two, two years or so. Uh, so number six and seven, while all seven are, are considered kind of strategic priorities, six and seven are considered the, the two more urgent ones. I'm just going to do the last couple slides here and then I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that uh, directors might have. But in addition to the seven strategies, we have three principles that would guide facility investments. Uh, the first is to ensure that we're sustaining what we've got before we start building new. There's a lot of your facilities that are showing age and in need of some reinvestment, some life cycle kind of reinvestment. You're doing some of that now. We just think that might be a kind of an anchoring <coughs> principle that, that you think about. You've got a lot of facilities, in some cases maybe even a little bit more than you need uh, in, in the longer term future. Uh, there will be a few needs for, for, for small amounts of facility, but by and large, you've got a lot of infrastructure and a lot of it's aging, and rather than kind of embark on some new priorities, 
we think uh, ensuring that the existing ones are are well served and continuing to to be functional and are reinvested in is is a, a, a good um, uh, uh, basis for decision making number two um, uh, any major infrastructure projects need to be uh, kind of explored collaboratively on a regional basis. We've kind of said that in strategic initiative number five or six, but uh, we, we see it as a principle. Uh, nobody should be operating um, by themselves and or will start making that inequity that I talked about in the funding formula even worse. And so we've, we've, we've got to solve that inequity, but then we can start moving forward and talking about um, some uh, future planning. And there are only a few small priorities we've, we've been able to identify for the next 10 years. There might be other things that come out of the woodwork, and I'll deal with that in, in, in a moment, but there will be groups that kind of say, well, gee, we, we need this or that in two years' time and that, that we don't even know about right now, and we've got a process for dealing with those. But, but any decisions need to be made on a regional basis. And number three is giving preference to multi-use and multi-use of using and inclusive kinds of spaces over single-use kinds of spaces uh, is something the public seems to, to have a great appetite for. And it's also a trend that, that's uh, fairly prevalent in the industry. And so we thought that might also be a kind of a principle that needs to be looked at every time you start thinking about a new space. Is this just for one age group, one interest group, and one use? Or is this something that could have adaptive uses in a, in a variety of areas? And is it something that's much more inclusive than that? So these three principles, the vision, the five goals, the seven um, uh, uh, strategic initiatives or priorities, are, are a big part of the plan, but the final couple of steps are just some tools to use uh, in case some some things come up. And and one of them is is a kind of an amenity a look at at, at a, a bunch of individual amenity types, uh, halls, pools, uh, sports fields, uh, arenas, curling rinks, things like that. And and so we've got a bit of recommendation on on specific items. Um, we think that uh, uh, you don't need uh, more aquatics capabil uh, capacity right now, but at some point in the next 10 years, you might need it. And whenever you do need it, we think building something in the south rather than expanding what you've got in the central area or the north is, is, is appropriate and, and because that's something that is very significantly used more by local people rather than driving long distances to. Arenas are characterized by people driving to longer distances. Pools are, are vary a lot more with a local catchment area, and, and so, so uh, that's, uh, something in the south that we think is needed. And to the extent that an uh, arena might need to be invest, reinvested in in a significant way or any kind of look at more arena capacity, we don't see a need for more arena capacity, more likely a reinvestment, a, a, a rebuilding of something that exists. We think you need to be moving in the longer term future towards multi-sheet facilities rather than a whole bunch of s single standalone <coughs> sheets, uh, which are much less effective to operate. And multi-sheet facilities offer more benefits in terms of use and, and are less costly to operate in terms of, of, of inputs. There's a couple of more comments. Uh, um, continue to monitor curling. Um, curling facilities in the region are underutilized. You may need to start phasing something out at some point in the future if you have to start reinvesting in a significant facility, but it's something that's worth monitoring. Um, you need to, to uh, uh, continue a focus on natural trails outdoors. It's one of your best investments in the past. It's, it, it's paying back huge dividends and needs to, to get um, uh, continued uh, investment and, and reinvestment and, and focus in the future. And uh, we can't find the bottom of the pickleball market. You just keep building and building and building. And so uh, we, we think that's something that needs to be monitored and looking at creative reuses of existing spaces, maybe spaces you don't need for curling in the future or whatever to be, to be reapplied into other uses potentially like pickleball. But these are some of the more specific things that are in the plan that are, are less strategic and more tactical, but still uh, we've provided that towards the end of your plan. 
And finally, we've got a few planning tools uh, that talk about how you evaluate things that will come up in the future and, and how you need to evaluate each capital project, uh, thinking about all the right things in the right order and putting in place priority, uh, priority setting processes uh, using appropriate criteria to, to help determine whether an idea someone comes before you with is a really high priority or a low priority. So I think uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board will stop there and uh, be happy to uh, further engage on any of these topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as chair, it's my duty to peruse the fellow directors and watch for hands to come up. And I can say it took about 20 minutes for me to see the first one, so you did have a captive audience. I thank you and those of the committee that uh, sat on this very difficult subject. Appreciate that. I have a speaker's list. First of all, I have Director Stone. Thank you, and, and I did go through the plan, and I know this is just a summary of some of the key findings, but I, I, I did really appreciate the plan. I think it does speak to um, some of the things that, at least from my perspective, other committee members or, or board members may see it differently, but um, some of the views that I think we gained through the process. Um, as as difficult as it may be. Um, a couple of the uh, strategic pieces on the low income access to recreation. Um, I know that we have a policy municipally. Um, it seems to be quite effective, but we find there's often inquiries from families or, or uh, seniors typically um, that don't know it exists. Um, and we've tried over the years to make it a lower barrier um, taking people at their word. We don't see a great abuse of the program, but we do know that when people are aware of it, there is a good uptake, and, it, and especially for people that are low-income families or seniors, um, it provides a, a real boost to quality of life because no, it's not only about the activity and fitness. Um, so I guess my suggestion would be that talking about that regional collaboration piece that we maybe come up with a region-wide piece where, where all the municipal partners and the regional partners come up with a, a strategy that we can all agree on so that we can help leverage the sameness of it so people don't feel like they need to go through the same process in Ladysmith to access things at FJCC or something different at North Couch and to go to, uh, to Fuller Lake or what have you so that once they're in the program that they can be carried. Um, through that, so I'd like to see that happen for sure. Um, and then on the communications piece, I think it's another thing. On an earlier meeting this morning, I made a comment in the very few comments we had this morning about um, the um, timing of different strategies and communications around a different initiative. But if we worked with our comms people throughout the region, again, all the municipalities and the regional district, and said, here's our communications timeline for this year, here's the important seasonal messages, and then we just utilized the same communications materials and leveraged them through our other um, partners, we could definitely, I think, solve that issue about the communication without really having to invest any, much if any more money, um, just get the maximum impact for those communication materials that are already being produced. Um, so I, I really appreciate that and I, and I appreciate those are low cost things that we can address just through that collaboration side. Um, and the principles all seem to connect, and I think that's intentional. And I think it, it, and you mentioned things like if there's a curling sheet or that might be decommissioned due to lack of, of uh, participation or interest, that we could, you know, revitalize it into a pickleball space. So we'll go back to principle number one around sustaining facilities. Well, when we do those new capital investments in our existing facilities, updating them so that they're making best use of the demands that are within the community. Uh, maybe we won't need to make any more facilities if we kind of circle back around on the existing facilities that need attention and change up the programming opportunities there to serve the needs of the communities better. Um, so I appreciate that you've been through a long process with us, not just the 30 years ago, but <laughs> this last couple of years. Um, and your good humor through it all. I know that uh, it wasn't always good, con or, or always good conversations, but not always easy conversations. And I appreciate your steady hand and good humor throughout the process, along with Mr. Elzinga and the rest of the team. Um, so I just want to say well done. Um, and when the time comes for a motion, I would be happy to, to move the recommendation. Thank you. I was um, just about to break into the theme song from Welcome Back, Cotter, but I decided <laughs> not to. I have <laughs> Director Sebring next.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Groundhog Day comes to mind for me. It just, <laughs> this just keeps coming back. Uh, I was on that select committee for the last, I guess, two years or whatever it was. And uh, I, I like the strat plan that's put forward. I have a few questions about it. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm disappointed that we couldn't deal with the elephant in the room, which is the, the funding piece. I mean, it's good to see that this is a priority strategy going forward that we need to deal with it, but um, the funding goes to a whole bunch of other things, including strategy number one with respect to governance structures and, and guiding documents being updated. I would submit that the governance structures are very much part of the funding model. Um, if, we, if we solve the funding model, we may end up having to to rework some of the governance structures depending on who's paying in to what. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with some of the progress that's been made that was made even before this. When I look at, at uh, strategy number five, the increasing regional collaboration and synergies, I mean, I can remember a day uh, when I first got elected 10 years ago when there was very little communication between staff at the Aquatic Center and staff at the Cowichan Community Center, and they're across the parking lot from each other, and they were doing programs that were sometimes in competition or sometimes perceived to be in competition, and there was just no communication there at all, and, and, and that has been fixed, and, and thank you to John and to Ernie Mansuetti at the, at the municipality for, for tearing some of those barriers down as we, as we move here, forward. Here. I'm, I'm a little bit um, curious about principle number one with respect to uh, ensuring that key facilities and spaces are sustained before contemplating new development. I get that, and I think it's important, but equally, at the community center about five years ago, we established a, a reserve fund to start looking at replacement because that facility then was 38 years old, and the best experts were telling us that that's the expe you know the life expectancy of a facility like that is around 38 or 40 years. Uh, we have some incredible staff there. Uh, I call them MacGyver. I mean, they just they keep that building running and keep it in, in good shape. But at what point does this principle um, need to be modified to say, you know, we do need to contemplate new capital development. We don't want to throw good money after bad at an old facility and, and, and is that identified in the in the strat plan in terms of a, a, a thing to move forward with? An excellent question. I, I, I think this needs to be interpreted, um, this principle number one. What we're suggesting is not that every facility that comes to the end of its functional lifespan needs to be replaced and or we need to keep it together with string and gum and bailing wire, kind of. Sure. But but that um, but that decisions be, be made that, that that maybe at some point they need to be replaced and or something slightly different needs to be provided instead or in some cases uh, at the end of their lifespan they don't need to be replaced that those decisions are all still on the table and should be on the table as part of any good. Um, uh, productive facility planning kind of scenario, um, but that we shouldn't be instead embarking on building something new at the expense of letting existing infrastructure run into the ground without kind of careful attention to its, its future. In the case of major facilities uh, like the, 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 uh, the, the, the one you're referring to, generally speaking, well, well, People have, have thought that facilities like that have a, a, a kind of a, a, a total lifespan of 40 or 50 years, that, that uh, it's often specific systems in them that fail, not the whole facility. Uh, an architect once said to me, concrete is a 100-year product. It's, it's a lot of the individual stuff that fails before that. And so we need to be thinking about when you have to reinvest in a roof, a mechanical system, an electrical system, a plumbing system, um, or, or a refrigeration system, all of those kinds of, of things. And, and when we need to update and make attractive facilities. So some of the steps you've made, for example, like the renewed washrooms and things, which I, I think have been really good investments in an old building, are going 
what, or could potentially uh, keep a building functional for another 25 years, but at some point it will need to be replaced, and that's when you start deciding, do we need to replace it with the same thing in the same location, or do we need something uh, quite different because it served the community well for 60 years, but in the future we need something different? I think all of that needs to be on the table. All we're trying to say in number one is, Let's not start spreading ourselves so thin so that any available capital goes to something new. We're not at that point in this situation. We've got good infrastructure now. The needs aren't that great for something new. Let's invest the majority of our capital in, in what we've already got, keeping it as functional as we can for as long as we can, and updating it to be really attractive and usable in the future. And that, that washroom example, I think, is a really good one. It's just one of many. Well, Does that answer there's, your there's, question? Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, there's other examples. The the most, the one that jumps out for me at the community center was the doors. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're in a center like that and a door swings open and closed 2,500 times a day, the wear and tear is considerably more than what you have on a door in your house. And the locks were starting to wear out. And I was there for a hockey game one night and the emergency exits, you could just put your fingernails behind and pull the door open because the whole crash bar mechanism had failed. So we replaced all the doors. But, you know, those are the kind of specific things. I've got some other comments on the strat plan when the motion comes forward, but I'll leave the floor for other folks right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. I have alternate Director Taylor. Sorry, still on a bit of a learning curve here. Um, thank you, a very comprehensive report. And obviously, uh, I've jotted down a few questions I have Please. that I would like to ask. Um, now, uh, on the phase one recreation survey, the response was roughly uh, 1,400 people? Yes. Yeah. So relative to the population of 89,000, that's 1.4%, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And even lower percentages, tenths of a percent or less on the participant thing, the uh, focus group and the, and yeah, what sort of level was there for salt air? Was that a, a separate assessment? Or um, that's a very good question and, and I'm afraid I don't have a specific answer to that for, for salt air, but it would have been uh, a, a much lower number. These results I think are quite reliable from a regional point of view and a little bit less reliable from a specific community point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the statisticians will tell you that in a population this size, something in the order of four to 500 randomly selected individuals can give you uh, a picture of what everyone's thinking uh, to, to within four, four percent, 19 times out of 20, which is an expression of a probability curve. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, so, so 1,400 is a lot more than that. And should, so regionally, I think we're, we're, we're really confident that we've got a good regional picture. When you start breaking it down to very small parts of the region, that information would be much less reliable, I think, is, your, is, I think is, is the answer the, to your question. That's the thing I would be focusing on is to see whether or not you know, what is okay for a region could apply, or okay for the whole region could apply within the areas. If I may, and, and just to add to that, specific to Saltaire, so you saw in there that the uh, displays were in nine uh, facilities, mm -hmm. plus the tenth being the Saltaire Community Center. So we had a specific request to go to the Saltaire Community Center and uh, gather input <laughs> that was done at the Saltaire Community Center. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, going on. Thank you, John. Um, to what extent did you consider the private sector as providing some of these facilities? For example, we have a relatively new venture down in, in Chimenez of a private sector gym, and in fact a second one is just on the verge of opening right now. And we also have a senior center that's been in place for uh, many, many years. Yeah. Um, are these incorporated into this planning? Uh, and, and would you consider to continue to support them? For example, for someone in Saltaire, particularly with the new uh, uh, Couch and Valley Trail, it now is quite safe to walk to the gym there rather than having to drive to the gym in, in Ladysmith, which of course in these days, a day and age of high price gas is a problem, and particularly thinking of seniors on low incomes. 
Um, so I just wondered if that might be a consideration there. Um, when you asked people about what they would want... Perhaps we'll let him uh, answer that one, okay. and then we'll sure. move on, yeah. please. Uh, the short answer is yes, we did consider um, services provided by the not-for-profit sector and the private sector, mm -hmm. as well as services provided by the public sector in our Phase 1 needs assessment. And, and all three of those sectors collectively provide lots of service. And, and we tried to provide a little bit of a, a framework to, to, to suggest how those three things get divided. And the public sector gets involved when not only is there direct benefit to the user of the service, uh, but there is also some indirect benefit to the community. So that's when you actually define a public service, and that's, how, that's a definition of a public good, is indirect benefit to all from which you cannot um, uh, escape. So that in, in places where services can't be provided by the, public, by the private sector or the not-for-profit sector and, and, and need to be operated at, at a, some level of subsidy, we think the public sector can and should jump in and operate in those cases only if indirect benefit to all can be shown. So that notion of health and wellness of individuals and that, that contributes to, to a good community and also connecting people to community and, and health and wellness of the community, those two parts of the vision statement, that's what, what needs to be driving public sector decision making. And, and that's what's driving some of our, our, our specific principles and, and uh, strategic priorities. And the private sector and the not-for-profit sector is actively involved, needing lots of direct benefits to users as well. And together, all three sectors make a complete system that works pretty well for everyone, is, is our view. And you've given a great example where there, there is some partnership. Uh, the public sector is involved in a, in a trail that gets people to a private opportunity in a way that's a little more fit than getting in a car and getting there, and so it'll, it, it's a, like a win-win situation. Before you carry on, Alternate Director Taylor, would it be okay if I went to the next speaker and come back to you? As long as you come back. I will come back to you. I have You're ticked your name with two ticks. Two ticks. <laughs> Director Nicholson was next on my list. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this strategy, um, and I really appreciate, I was part of this committee too, and you know, I, I think recreation is one of those things that we need to invest in regionally. It makes it's most uh, economically uh, makes most economic sense. And I really appreciate the staff, as as um, Mayor Sieber, Director Sebring mentioned. I, I really think the staff have led on this collaboration. So I feel pretty good about the recreation moving forward. Um, but the one question I would have is about the strategic infrastructure. Uh, delivery strategies, the service delivery strategies. I am curious as to why there isn't a strategy specific to um, how or the need to integrate outdoor recreation and um, our other recreation programming because we heard loud and clear in that phase one uh, needs assessment that the community is very interested in outdoor recreation. Perhaps there's been a shift more towards the outdoor recreation and we provide great trails and you know lots of tot parks and kinds of stuff like that but we don't run uh, I don't I, I think that there's a, a lot of room to improve sort of the integration with our in an overall recreation strategy and I'm curious as to why that didn't become a delivery strategy Good. Um, thank you for the question. Firstly, let me agree with your your thought about what the facts are. I think there has been a very significant increase in participation in outdoor activities, especially informal outdoor activities, and so use of passive parks, trails, uh, picnic grounds, campgrounds, uh, all kinds of outdoor individually uh, kind of uh, focused uh, recreation, I think, is definitely part of the picture. Um, it's also um, some of your most cost-effective part of your delivery system, especially in the way of trails, which probably caters to a broader cross-section of the community than any other single category of facilities. And and so we have suggested that that's something that, that needs to be kind of focused on is, is the trail system. Um, but we're also... Um, 
uh, wanting to, and maybe in my verbal presentation I didn't use examples of and should have, but we're also hoping that, that indoor and outdoor recreation is part of many of the strategies that we've talked about. It should be part of regional collaboration, it should be part of regional funding, it should be part of uh, regional marketing and communication systems. A single map that shows every opportunity and how to get to it um, uh, in an off-road option, just like we, we, we heard from Saltaire, um, it, it w w is, is kind of where we need to go and we're almost there. But we need to be incorporating indoor and outdoor in most of these um, uh, strategies that, that I've, I've talked to around um, uh, facility planning, um, uh, funding, um, uh, governance structures, financial barriers, and, and there's fewer financial barriers to using outdoor spaces, engagement protocols, and increased investment in marketing and promotion. All of that should relate to the outdoor uh, amenities and indoor infrastructure. Um, uh, but but uh, while I agree with you how important that is, um, perhaps we haven't put enough examples of some of the outdoor spaces into some of these strategies, and maybe we should have. But, but uh, definitely the outdoor spaces are a priority, and you've got a great park system that's, that's uh, meeting most of those needs already. But, but uh, um, uh, I, I think I'm agreeing with you and, and hoping that these strategies are seen in the broadest possible context to include both indoor and outdoor. Thank you. Uh, microphone, Director Nicholson. Thank you. So I'm going to go through my list of first-time speakers, and I'll return to those who have already spoken. So next is Director Yanni DiNardo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, I would like to just say that this is a very good, I, I'm very pleased to see this plan. It's been a long time. We've been through quite a few. I'm, I'm happy to see it, and I will also support the recommendation but the the principles here with the regional partners is great we're doing the recreation guide we're purchasing co with collaboration um, there's just one gap and I'm not sure if it even fits here or where does it fit the arts and culture we're actually we've rented another room to the arts and uh, arts committee and island save whoop, community center um, and we are having a meeting about the heritage. So we have a lot of different museums that are kind of fading, struggling in the background. Shawnigan has an awesome one. We have an old school, Coke Silas School. So we were meeting in October, but I wondered where it fits mm. in. I'm assuming it fits in with all arts and culture, and I don't see it here. Uh, very good question. Um, I, I would hope that we would fit it within arts and culture as part of the, the, the culture of the community and, and, and that the heritage of the community is de a definite part <laughs> of community identity, spirit, culture, and, and pride. Um, and by community, I mean region. Um, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I think that we didn't pay it enough justice in the in the report thinking that maybe our uh, our terms of reference were a little bit more limited than, than looking at it and so uh, if this report uh, does get approved and the board approves it and uh, there's agreement that strategy number seven is a priority strategy hopefully in the very near future we would embark on some of those things and ensure that it includes heritage at that point if I can just add to that, Mr. Chair, that I, I believe pieces are being done in the regional district. Uh, um, so we do have an arts and culture division that uh, has very limited capacity to uh, address some of that. Heritage has been part of our planning. Our economic development manager was really involved in place speaking, and that leads into the Couch in 2050 initiative that sp speaks a lot about what our community should look like. So, so a lot of this work is being done in pieces right now. We need to collaborate a lot better and, and on this upcoming strategy. Follow up. So there will there will be uh, a public engagement in October, um, talking about heritage. Maybe that's an opportunity if people are interested to get involved. Thank you. Thank you. I have Director Wilson next. First time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was I uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, can you? For, I, I've got two things. I, one for Mr. Alzinger, but first of all, for you, sir. Can you focus a little bit more on the? Um, the question of the surface tra uh, trails that uh, you mentioned just now? 
I, I think I was meaning surfaced and unsurfaced, and, and that maybe even unsurfaced are more important than surfaced, although that's a, a more of a technical issue and a, and a context. In some places they need to be surfaced, in, in other places they don't. But, but uh, in my view, trails are some of the best investments uh, a region and, and a municipality can make in terms of recreation. Uh, I say that because I think they cater to the broadest possible cross-section of the residents of a community as well as non-residents. Um, I think they're, um, uh, in terms of dollar of investment, one of the best um, kind of returns on investment for relatively small amounts of capital and operating uh, uh, dollars, one gets huge amounts of use. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it conforms to the very significant behavioral trend in the marketplace of recreation from highly structured activity towards unstructured informal kinds of activity. Um, and, and, and trails properly done yeah, um, uh, meet such a wide variety of types of uses from uses on wheeled vehicles or with strollers or, or uh, uh, um, bikes and, and skateboards and, and inline skating to walking to 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 uh, all kinds of other other uses potentially on trail systems including equestrian uses and others so it's it's just such a wide variety of, of different kinds of needs that they can accommodate depending on the surface um, that, that, that uh, we're finding it is one of the best investments you can make Thank you, and, and something that I'm, I'm going to be looking at very carefully because it, I think it is very, very good um, as far as linkages to various other parts. Um, principle number one, I think, is a great idea, sustainability. Um, and I've got to ask the question of when we build something, um, do we have a scheduled maintenance plan in, in place for these things, or do we just wait until things go wrong? I mean, for instance, I know that I have regular maintenance on my car. It's lasted a lot of years, and it probably lasts a lot longer. That's what I'm saying. What what maintenance plans are in place? Um, I will try my best uh, through to Director Wilson. Very complicated question um, because uh, first of all, it depends on the facility that you're constructing. Um, as Director Sebring has already uh, identified, uh, we've put in place reserve funds currently for the Couch and Community Center for any needed. Uh, facility improvements down the road. Um, most of the operating plans and operating budgets you see right now address trying to keep the, the infrastructure going. But uh, we have been in a history where we're in borrowing, where we borrow for a lot of these uh, facility improvements. And it is really tough to put on the public the debt that comes with that improvement as well as saving for the future. So for instance, the Couch and Lake Sports Arena renovation that happened in 2010, 2011, it was a $7.5 million project. Um, we managed to get some grant funding for that to bring it down to 6.5 million, but the public there has borne the debt of that and will until approximately 2030. So it is a balancing undertaking. One more follow-up? Oh, I'm being pretty lenient, Director Wilson. So. There is no scheduled maintenance, there's no plans in place? That I, is that what I'm hearing, is that correct? Uh, there are plans in place um, on some specific facilities. So for instance, the Couch and Community Center had a nine year, what we called a sustainability plan, which balanced current projects, like the recent parking lot project, like the washrooms, like uh, improvements in the theater, as well as putting money into reserve. That was actually called a sustainability plan for that particular facility. We have attempted to have that conversation with the Couch and Lake Recreation Commission, but we are really deferring now to our asset management. So asset management is starting to drive everything we do and how we keep standards going currently, as well as investing for the future. Thank you very much. I have Director Morrison next. Just before, can I just respond to that also? Absolutely. Um, we were making in this principle number one a distinction between regular maintenance and, and, and to use the analogy of car maintenance, it would be regular maintenance like in a swimming pool doing an annual kind of uh, review of, of the equipment. All of that's included in operating budgets and there are regular maintenance plans for all of the facilities in place. But it's that life cycle maintenance, that re replacement of a roof or a boiler or resurfacing of a floor or updating of a washroom that we were really focusing on in this principle number one. And again, uh, Director Morrison. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
this has been an excellent process, and, and while I haven't agreed with every aspect of, of the, uh, the process and how we've got to this report, it is a good report. I think it's reflective of, uh, of some pretty solid work that went into this. I was at some of the early engagement meetings and uh, heard a lot of what the community had to say. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised by the um, outdoor rec aspect of what the report came up with when I don't know that we were necessarily looking at that as a, as a specific target area when w this process began. But it's clear that it's a priority for our, our, our taxpayers and our various users. So um, I think we do need to focus on that. Um, there's something that wasn't really addressed and there's a significant uh, body of users out there and, and it's uh, motorized recreation activities that, you know, it continues to grow, though there's fewer and fewer places where they can engage in their activities. Um, I, I'm, I'm wanting to agree with the, the perspective of asset management. I know that when that, wasn't it a million dollar grant we got for the Couch and Lake Sports Arena? In 2010, senior governments were telling us that you had to do asset management, you had to do your life cycle work, and you had to maintain your, your facilities because you weren't getting additional grants in the future if you haven't done your appropriate maintenance. So that's really important and I'm glad that we're on, on that role. My specific question though is, um, we're engaging in corporate strategic planning and are you, I guess Mr. Elzinga, in a position to uh, report to, to this group when we're doing that planning, uh, the extent and the time and the resources that would be needed if we were to create this and make this a priority in the corporate strategic plan, um, approximately how long, uh, there, the, that number three in this report is a big one and we could put that in our corporate strategic plan and that would be a priority that would probably take up most of the rest of the term. I know you get all the tough questions. <laughs> Mr. Chair, through to uh, Director Morrison, I'll, uh, I'll attempt an answer. So um, on this phase three, uh, which is, uh, I believe, the recreation funding that uh, Director Morrison is referring to, I, I'm going to suggest that a lot of the work has now been done. So um, we, uh, as staff and as our consulting team, came to the board in April of last year with recommendations around that and those recommendations really still stand. So uh, the intention again is to come in August to this board and present all that information again and the board can direct at that time whether we want to pursue that or not. Um, so the original uh, funding amount for the entire three and a half year investment so far was $155,000 approved by the board uh, for the 2016 budget and has been carried over uh, ever since. Uh, we entered 2019 with $60,000 of that remaining, and by the time this exercise is done, I anticipate approximately $25,000 will be left to address anything further that comes forward. So that's the financial resource piece. From the human resource piece, I can tell you that it's been a significant part of my work for about uh, three, three and a half years uh, on this particular initiative, as well as especially Mr. Mansweddy and Mr. Postings from Ladysmith and other members of the recreation team. But again, a lot of that work has been done. Um, we are gonna be coming forward with, uh, here's where we are to date. I'll be coming forward and discussing that every agreement with the Couch and Aquatic Center has expired and we need to do something about that. Um, and uh, so that's gonna be the crux of the conversation. But a lot of the information and research has been put in place. There may be some that's required. I believe there's some funding to address that. Thank you. I'm going to return to alternate director Taylor. See, I didn't forget you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. In deference to you and the others, I've reduced my comments, questions to only three <laughs> more. Now, you. So we'll do one at a time, okay? Oh, yeah, one at a time. Thank you. And if you could put your microphone a little closer. Sorry. Thank you. I'll get the hang of this yet. Uh, I've, I've reduced it down to three. The first one, you mentioned the issue of asking people about new developments that they might like. Uh, I guess having been involved in that kind of issue before, have you asked the second question, 
are they willing to pay anything toward it? Because often they just think, well, my goodness, it would be wonderful. I'd like to see a nice dock and salt air down on the ocean to go swimming from and to go canoeing from. But I'm not that enthusiastic to put a whole bunch of money in it. So did, did you have The vast that? majority of um, the, the population out there through all of our forms of interaction with them, not just the survey, um, seemed quite satisfied with the current level of investment in spaces, indoor or outdoor spaces, certainly indoor spaces. So there wasn't a lot of need uh, or demand for, for more docks or, or any other kind of, of facility. I think that uh, this, this isn't a plan that suggests there's a bunch of those outstanding needs yeah. that need to be dealt with in the next few years. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. if you hold your next two, I'll return to you, I promise, again. Uh, alternate Director Tatum. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through to the speakers. Um, following on um, with uh, Alternate Director uh, Taylor's comments about financing, I'm looking at, by my calculation, a total budget of about $16 million for the uh, recreation in the CVRD, and we've got this uh, population in excess of uh, 80,000, so we're looking at, you know, by my limited mathematics skills, something about $200 for every man, woman, and children, child in the CVRD for recreation, if that's an accurate uh, uh, metric. So I'm curious. Are we providing good value for that $200 for every man, woman, and child? And of course it's scaled because there's many people in area I that don't even live there and are paying a lot more than that $200 per child. And how does that compare to other regions? Thank you. So Mr. Chair, if I can, through to Alternate Director Tatum. Uh, I'll start the conversation and, and involve Mr. Kieber uh, in this discussion because um, um, I'm not quite sure it's fair to discuss a total amount of recreation in terms of every man, woman, and child because it's more than residential that pays for each of these facilities. So this involves all classifications of assessment, not just residential. And if Mr. Kieber wants to comment on that or if I've covered it, uh, let me know. But I, I, I want to be careful about that. But I certainly defer back to uh, Brian Johnson for a discussion on public good. The, the uh, sp sp level of spending here, which I think you've correctly kind of uh, capsulated, is uh, fairly uh, um, uh, typical in BC communities and in Western Canadian communities. We uh, do surveys of Western Canadian communities every few years to look at total levels of spending per capita, and you're, you're right in the, the kind of average. Thank you very much. Moving on to Director Stone for a second. So I wanted to follow up on Dr. Or Dr. Nicholson. I keep trying to call you doctor. <laughs> Director Nicholson's comments around the outdoor spaces. And, I, and, and I'm not sure, but I know that we've had some local discussions about more programming centered around utilizing those spaces. So not just the fact that they're there and they offer passive recreation opportunities, but I know a couple of our um, youth um, programs have actually been geared towards using, using the park spaces. It's not just the playground and stuff but nature walks and um, utilizing the trails that we have and hanging up literacy things along the way so that they have uh, especially in the sort of toddler to, to six groups um, have some programming opportunities so I just in in, in, in the context of, of this this uh, deliverable in the document itself you know, I, I kind of use it as a, a strategic piece and the board has some influence on how the actual tactical pieces come out. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, that things like utilizing and actually offering programming, like our, our uh, boot camps now are actually geared toward being at the beach and using some of the natural features to accommodate things like fitness boot camps, um, nature walks, um, biking, um, biking right, for example, for youth, um, teaching them the skills by utilizing those lower cost facilities, if you will. 
Um, so I think that that's something that we can do as a board strategically and hopefully staff see that as an opportunity. Um, and to Director Yanni DiNardo's comments around uh, the heritage piece of arts and culture, I know municipally we had that conversation as well as stop siloing heritage off and actually bringing it in because it is such a part of culture, especially when you talk about tourism and stuff um, and economic development is arts, culture, and heritage definitely are, are good bedfellows in terms of um, programming and, uh, and investment. Um, so I think that, that we can incorporate that when the board provides direction on strategy number seven saying, yeah, as part of our arts and culture strategy, we do need to take a, a closer look at heritage and utilize the assets we have. And thank you for bringing up those opportunities on the horizon. I think Heritage BC is going to be trying to facilitate all of our heritage groups coming together as well to start to sort of package it up better regionally. Um, I think that's a great opportunity for us. And um, and around that placemaking piece, which I think you also, um, I think somebody said place speak, but I think it was supposed to be place making. Um, and then of course the asset management piece is an overarching thing we need to do with all of our facilities and, and uh, infrastructure um, to make sure that we're, we're doing all that proper maintenance. But um, I just, any comments on that programming in the, in the sort of trails and park spaces that we have? I just want to stress how important that is and take it back to a comment you made in the first round of, of questioning around the, the kind of uh, fee subsidy kind of programs that, that are in place. Um, because it's not just a matter of waiving fees or giving um, low-income families money to, to, to help recreate. It's a matter of finding a basket of, way, of strategies to help people with financial barriers to access. One of them is more outdoor programming. And, and there are others as well. I mean, we can start dealing with user groups uh, like minor hockey organizations, minor ball organizations, and asking them what their policy is when someone wants to play and can't get can't pay the fee, what are they doing about it? We can ask. We can make more, uh, do a lot more through the school system, which is the great equalizer. We can do a lot more in terms of special events, which are also more typically uh, free. And so there's a whole range of things we can do to try and, and reduce the financial barrier outside of just giving money to, to families. And, and outdoor programming, I think, is one, because as you mentioned, that, that space is often cost less to operate. Thank you. Uh, follow? Uh, Mr. If, Elzinga? If I may, Mr. Chair, because I have uh, two answers to, to those questions, and uh, and I'm going to be very careful on how I say the first one, because um, we're talking about alignment and alignment of parks working with recreation, and uh, so um, we are certainly having those discussions at the staff level that we need to align better, and uh, that is certainly a focus for Mr. Farquhar and the Parks Division to be doing more programming in parks. We are certainly having those discussions at the staff level right now. The second piece was around arts, culture, and heritage, and a fairly big basket of, uh, of initiatives and, and uh, items that go with that. Um, it's beyond current capacity uh, with the staff to address that. And if uh, this was the will of the board to further investigate arts, culture, and heritage, uh, staff would certainly be discussing about resourcing it. Thank you. Director Marcotte. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to bring to your attention that um, the population in both electoral areas and the municipal uh, population, they're not equal. And I think we have to keep in mind that the people who are going into these programs and these kinds of things, they're not paying you. There is really going to be very difficult to find a way to keep that payment for, uh, for the people smoother. And I think that it's going to be difficult to move that forward, knowing that uh, some, some uh, situations just don't have that uh, capacity to keep that. Up. So I just bring that up as something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Director Marcotte. I have Director, just being mindful of our time, we still have a closed session and we have something coming in at 12.30, so just being mindful of that. Director Staples. Um, thank you. Thank you for all the work that everyone, um, well, that you have put in, staff and, and everyone um, on the board prior to this board. I just wanted to ask um, Mr. Alzinga uh, about the connection with the school district um, and moving this forward because one of the things that, um, as I understand it, is the potential 
um, or not maybe the potential through this, but I think it would come through this, of school districts to do um, more partnering with different, um, whether it's community centers or groups and organizations to bring programming into the schools rather than kids having to go out of the schools. Um, they've had a lot of success with that in other countries, bringing down things like um, drug use from, um, I think it was somewhere in the 60s percentile down to under 10% in short times, and I'm wondering if there's any models of th that are being explored. Mr. Chair, I'm uh, relishing this one. Um, for approximately four years or so, uh, our recreation team has partnered with the school district, Island Health, our Couch and Community Health Network, uh, Couch and Tribes and other agencies on a physical literacy strategy. So we've had uh, a lot of activity around that. We've brought in speakers. Um, we have playground markings outside our facilities. It has been a significant initiative really um, at the staff level to incorporate activity and healthy uh, activity into the schools, into our medical facilities. If you go into an immunization clinic right now, you will see a lot of information around physical activity and being active for life, and that's part of that same partnership. The one activity that I've been involved with for the last uh, few months has been a multi-sport initiative. So um, we're finding that uh, children have participated in one sport for a major part of their lives, and when they don't participate in that sport any longer, they lose activity, and so a Recent initiative is a multi-sport initiative. We've got $12,000 from Island Health for this funding to pair community sport coaches with elementary school teachers that are not PE specialists so that kids in schools get that um, uh, specialized sport education in a variety of sports. We have recently been identified um, as potentially one of five pilot communities in the province to further that work. We're having some conversations with principals right now. I have three schools in the south end, three in the core, one in Lake Cowichan, Chimenez, uh, and potentially some from School District 68 that are participating in that program. So uh, next week we will be having a meeting with the school district, with principals, with teachers associations, and our recreation departments on partnering uh, on an activity like that. Excellent. Follow-up? Um, and a follow-up would be, we had a presentation from Francis Kelsey students around um, that outdoor programming that they were doing with um, trails. So is there is part of it to look at also furthering those opportunities throughout the, the, the region? This particular initiative does not, um, but uh, for instance, the Mill Bay Nature School, which is part of this initiative, uh, has not had the traditional PE classes and is looking for adding that onto the program for elementary school. So this particular initiative is specifically on that one. Uh, programs around secondary students would probably come later. Thank you, Alternate Director Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Be as quick as I can. Two quick points. Very pleased to see the focus on uh, outdoor uh, recreation, particularly walking. It's a very big feature in Saltaire. I'd just like to point out a very high percentage of retirees, a number on lower incomes, therefore they can walk, and they walk on the, the streets as well as going to the park. One issue we have, for example, is getting a wider right-of-way on a piece of road between the park and the, and, the, and the residential area to make it safer. But that's a road issue, not a parks issue. The other point I would like to make is, make is about principle one. Um, I would like to think that maybe from our perspective here, we might consider a bit of a modification in how that's done. And that could be ensure that the existing key recreational facilities are reassessed before contemplating their uh, being sustained or being replaced with new capital development. And the reason I suggest that is we have the school in Saltaire, uh, which right now, if we follow the sustaining approach, we're looking at $3 million over the next few years to try to bring it up to standard. But there was mention today about washrooms. They aren't um, wheelchair access right now. And, and much of the facilities. At the end of the day, we would pour an awful lot of money into it, and we would still end up with an old facility. We've been needing a business plan prepared on actually what the needs are by the various groups that are there. There are a lot of people from outside the community using it. So you really need a business plan to begin with to show what might be considered, and then maybe look at the option of a 
earthquake-proof new facility uh, as opposed to pouring $3 million into the existing. So I think that's the kind of thinking I would hope might come out of this and really that kind of thinking on the facility almost is an issue to bring forward before making the decisions on the specific recreation. Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, more, you, more comments than questions. <coughs> well, but if you'd like to reply. Just a quick reply. Uh, the tools that we've got at the end of the strategic plan are meant to deal with exactly a project as has been mentioned by Director Taylor, that when projects like that are identified, they need to go through a kind of a standardized business plan kind of process mm -hmm. and then a prioritization process before they, they, they are put in front of public bodies for any kind of public support. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing that we've got in the end and, and uh, hope that it might be applied to projects uh, as the, the example has just been mentioned. Thank you. I'm going to have Director Morrison to close. Thank you. Uh, through you to, I it might need Mr. Elzinger or, or, or Brian. Um, just a couple of things that, uh, if people aren't aware, that we are actually doing some programming in our outside spaces already. Uh, there's a, a, a summer drop-in program for, for youth in the Couch and Lake area in which uh, we go to different parks and different communities. There's a, there's a, a licensed supervised person that, that, that leads these activities. and. They're pretty successful. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, at Arbutus Park in Yubo, there's a supervised swimming area, which is a great thing, and there's not that many of them left. But one of the uh, burdens of success of having that is that we have unexpected buses arrive, and next thing you know, you can go from a small group of people on the beach, supervised, and the ratios and everything are correct to having a whole bunch of people on the beach and then the supervision and the lifeguard ratios aren't what they're supposed to be. So we're working in, in the western area to coordinate and, and ask for some heads up and notice from some of these groups. But are those sorts of examples going to be uh, brought forward and explored when we, we talk about more of these sort of regional collaboration and, and and programming in our park spaces because I think we can learn from some of those lessons that we sort of inadvertently stumbled into? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your terse answer. Do you want to follow up? Can you be just as terse? I didn't think so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did not mean to suggest earlier that uh, we weren't providing programming in parks. Uh, I was just trying to suggest that uh, um, through greater partnerships, we could increase that. And, and uh, not only at the regional and even inter-regional level, uh, when you start talking about things like lifeguarded beaches, but uh, also at the community level. Thank you. I think Director Stone has something. I'd just like to move the recommendation. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this? Director Sebring. Yeah, I, I waited to this point because now the motion's on the table and we can actually um, formally consider some things. As part of the the select committee, I would call it the last meeting when when the funding thing essentially, for lack of a better word, fell apart. Um, the recommendation came back from Brian that, that we look at a sub-regional model, at least in the interim, that, that there would be clusters where, where potentially there was some opportunity to work together. I didn't, I must admit, I didn't read the strategic plan word for word. I gave it a skim. I don't see it in there. Is it still there? Has it been abandoned? And I mean, and I do that in the context of, of the, or I ask that in the context of the comment that was made earlier about the agreements on the Aquatic Center expiring. And I was just joking with the director for Area E that, yeah, actually, now we're going to start charging you double. I mean, all right, we're, do we go back to two tier? Is the sub regional part of the strategic plan as an interim until we, we solve the funding? Not if we ever can, or, or did we? Uh, wh where is that? I know, but it, like I said at the start, it's the elephant of the room. So, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, first of all, to my understanding, and, and I certainly look to uh, Mr. Johnson to correct me, but uh, the recommendation that he put forward was a hierarchical model, not a sub-regional model, and it turned into a recommendation at the table 
uh, for a sub-regional services committees in the future to look at the funding model. So I believe the original consultant recommendation was a hierarchical model, and we can discuss that more in August when I bring forward the background information. Um, so as I said at the outset in the preamble that this plan does not speak specifically to the background recommendations around facility funding. It does speak to the fact that there is a high priority strategy required around facility funding. And so again, uh, it is not specific within the plan, but is certainly implied within the plan that we will be coming back as the first order of business to identify next steps. You see, and, and if I may, just to close, uh, that's my problem with this plan. I'm gonna support it, but I'm gonna support it reluctantly because um, to me, that's the central issue in, in, in a lot of this. It was, let's be honest, it was the reason this review, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it's my perception, that's the reason this review was launched and we never actually got there. We got a whole bunch of other really good stuff, but we never actually addressed the core issue and this still doesn't address the core issue. Uh, the only reason that I will vote in favor is because strategy six is a priority, which is that we have to resolve this issue. And Absolutely. and, and Hopefully we deal with that uh, in August. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? First of all, thank you very much for your engaged discussion and respectful discussion. Uh, and thanks to the presenters. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. That was a golf clap. <laughs> Recreation term? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, Ms. Harrison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's no unfinished business. There is no new business, so we move to question period. Anyone in the public wish to ask a question at this point? Seeing nodding of heads, thank you very much. Ms. Harrison? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the next item is closed session. We would need a uh, motion to move into closed session. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed, if any? We will go into closed session now. <laughs>